Our gospel reading this morning raises several questions for me. The first of which is, did Jesus just get up on the wrong side of the bed that morning? He starts off as we would expect him when the over-eager John and James ask if they should rain down fire upon the Samaritans who have not welcomed them. Jesus rebukes them for their aggression, which is the reaction we might expect from one who Paul says sums up the commandments as you shall love your neighbor as yourself. But it takes a turn when Jesus encounters three men who are willing to welcome him and, in fact, want to follow. Instead of the expected welcome, he gives a cryptic response to the first one who says that they will follow him wherever, telling them that foxes have holes and birds have nests, but that Jesus has neither. Next, he gives a seemingly heartless response to the one who first wants to bury his dead father, saying, let the dead bury the dead. And then finally, Jesus dismisses the third one when he asks to go home and just say goodbye to his family first. He dismisses him with a no one who puts their hand to the plow and looks back at it is fit. And that's despite the fact that this very act of going home to say goodbye to loved ones is something that prophets such as Elijah do before they set off on their journeys. Cranky and annoyed might seem germane descriptors of Jesus here. Some have classified his responses as sarcastic or dismissive of the three potential recruits. None of these are terms that we would normally associate with Jesus. Over the centuries, scholars and commentators have offered a plethora of possibilities and of explanations of what exactly Jesus is doing here. All their explanations do make wonderful starting points for long theological reflections, as well as for interesting Bible studies and discussions. And I wrestle with each of them each and every time that I read this passage. When I read it one time, a particular explanation seems to hit the proverbial nail on the head. But then when I return to it three years later, that answer seems shallow. And the next one seems to be the one that explains it all. And then the third time I hit it, Neither of those seem to fit, and it's another that explains what it is I am to do with these words of Jesus. And this goes on and on. I have yet to come up with one single answer that is satisfactory or conclusive to me about what Jesus is expressing here. Now, most of the explanations point out the palatable sense of urgency in most of the stories of calls throughout the Gospel of Luke. Jesus says, follow me, and men are abandoning boats and fathers on the shoreline. Tax collector booths are being left vacant, and families are left without seemingly another word. Therefore, they conclude, here Jesus is only responding as he would have to anyone who didn't share their eagerness and urgency. But I find that puzzling because Jesus doesn't always seem to respond that way. In the first chapters of Luke, we are told that Jesus stays at the home of the soon-to-be Peter and actually heals his mother-in-law. Elsewhere, as we heard last week, He tells those who wish to follow him to know that they are to stay where they are, not to give up their lives at home, but to minister there. So what warrants the different response to these people and these situations? Is there a list of rules or exceptions that I've missed somewhere? 
For being a Christian would be so much easier for me, and I think for many of us, if you could look up some formula that gave us the exact number of years and the time frame we had to do certain tasks in, telling us you must do A, B, and C to be a Christian, unless, of course, you meet this list of exceptions. I would find it much simpler if there was a recipe that told us it took two parts of Bible study, one part of worship, and three parts of service to make up a faithful life. Formulas and recipes assure us that by following the steps in order, we know what the eventual product or outcome will be. And perhaps that's my difficulty with this passage. Not so much what Jesus says, but how am I supposed to live this out? Does it mean that it's always the right thing to leave home to follow Jesus? Or is it always right to return and care for the people there? Isn't there at least a small part of all of us that wants to maintain a sense of control by knowing definitively what we need to do in this Christian life? Should we always stop to help the person who is broken down on the side of the road, even if we're not sure if it's quite safe? Or can we make an exception if there's someone else in the car who would also be endangered? These are the questions that we face each and every day. It's compounded because we live in a culture that tells us that we have the freedom to choose whatever we want to do, whatever we want to believe, and how we live our lives. Yet paradoxically, it also tells us that if we don't make the correct choice at the correct time, that we've lost our chance at security and safety. Think of how we are told we have the freedom to plan our retirement any way that we want, but we better start planning at the right time and choose the right investments if we have any hope to do so. So when this call to be a Christian comes to us in a life that is heard in the midst of this back and forth messages of personal freedom of choice, and that there are limited choices in time frame, it's no wonder that we respond with hesitation of what to do. We may wonder why it's okay one time to say goodbye to the family and not another. How does one know in any of our choices if we are doing this disciple thing correctly? Over the last two weeks, those who attended the Sunday seminar series have watched a video depicting Diedrich Bonhoeffer's own struggles with these sorts of questions, but in a much more serious context in light of the rise of Hitler and the Third Reich in Germany. While Bonhoeffer recognizes that there is a high cost of discipleship, as he spells out in a book of that same title, he still struggles with what it means to live that out in the face of the evil taking place at that time. It's not only the cost of it to himself that he wrestles with, but more so, what is it that he is called to do as a Christian? Does Christian being a Christian means never lying, never using deceit or deception, never resorting to violence no matter what is happening? Or can it mean using these to help another? And if you do, are they still considered sinful or wrong? These are more than just philosophical conversations for Bonhoeffer. As he considers them, and lifts them out in the shadows of the rising Nazi power and the program of racial purity that were killing thousands of Jews and other undesirables in the society. 
what Bonhoeffer comes to conclude is that the freedom that one receives as a Christian is the freedom to serve others. And to do so also includes a responsibility. It's a responsibility to wrestle with such questions in the light of the situation and the light of the people that one finds oneself with. He concludes that ethics had to be considered and questions of what we are to do answered just as Jesus did, not with some pre-made list, but concretely living out in specific human situations and sometimes at great personal cost. He doesn't provide a recipe for life. Instead, what Bonhoeffer finds as he struggles with these questions leads to him being a double agent, undertaking acts of deception, and finally his participation in a failed plot to assassinate Hitler. All this results in his execution shortly before the war ended. As he lays out what leads him to these decisions, he tells of how he has just led to undertake these as he joins with others struggling to live in light of what God desires for all in this very real case of suffering. He doesn't advocate them as some sort of Christian blueprint of this is what all Christians must do whenever faced with tyranny. What he does conclude is that living the Christian life sometimes includes living with the conflicted and unsettled conscience that can only be quieted by God's own grace that forgives. He sees the Christian life isn't going to be in the future a life of religion, but instead a life where we recognize and live out the same sort of life that Jesus lived that recognizes that God is with us in the suffering, enters into and experiences our pain, and walks with us through it. As I read this passage, this time I have not come up again with a definitive answer of what's going on here or a three-point plan on how to apply it to my own or our lives. For here and elsewhere throughout Scripture, Jesus at times seemingly contradicts himself. But maybe that's because Jesus here is on a journey, seeking to serve God. And he does so living in a reality of not only the people he meets, but their situation and his at that time. As Bonhoeffer comes to conclude, that means living out the commandment to love others within the messiness and the pain of life at a particular moment. So instead of giving us a formula for life in the Gospels, the Gospels point us to travel in the same direction that Jesus journeys. For as one blogger describes this journey, it's always on the lookout, not for a place of rest, but the next place where God will act. Our Christian life invites us to join that journey, not so that we repeat exactly what Jesus and his first followers did, but so that we may be part of God's actions wherever and however they may play out. That is both the responsibility and the freedom of choosing this way of life. It is to live with those questions, to live with those uncertainties, but to live so in the grace and love of God that allows us the peace that even if we get the individual answer 
wrong or incorrect, that we are still on the same path and on the path that leads us to the world where God's peace and justice is evident to all. Amen. Right now in Long Beach, California, starting on Thursday and ending on Tuesday, representatives from throughout the United States for the United Church of Christ have gathered for our biannual synod. In this, they will grapple and they will struggle with questions. They will disagree on some of the answers and they will discover probably in another 10 or 15 years that perhaps one or two of the answers and conclusions that they come to was wrong. But that is our faith. It is a faith that embraces that struggle. It is a faith that embraces the same sort of spirit that we hear in the Declaration of Independence, written at a time when African Americans could still be held as slaves and women were still viewed as property. We live on a journey. It is a journey that we are accompanied by God on and that we are invited to face those struggles, not to ignore them and to live in the paradox of each and every moment, bringing our values, but most importantly, God's love and God's grace and forgiveness to each and every one of these. So let us, as we go from here, go forth, remembering Bonhoeffer, who struggled, who never said that he came up with the right answer, but only sought to serve God in the midst of very real human life. May we go out and do the same. Amen.